Thank you for joining us today on World Maritime Day. My name is Noel Campbell and I'm the curator at the National Museum of Ireland, Country Life in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. The title of my talk today is Wild Atlantic Voices and it's really two stories in one. On one hand I want to talk about the National Museum of Ireland's work developing a permanent gallery that will display a number of boats and associated material from our Irish folklife collection and archives and on the other hand I want to detail how engagement with coastal and island communities along our west coast is central to the gallery's progress and how communal and individual voices from those who use and used traditional boats is driving the narrative of our new gallery. More on that a little later. The National Museum of Ireland, Country Life, is the only one of four National Museum sites located outside of Dublin. Our archaeology, natural history and decorative arts and history museums are in our capital city. Our museum is set in a county steeped in maritime history with an extensive coastline and we are fortunate to be only a 25 minute drive from the Atlantic Ocean. The National Museum of Ireland Country Life is split between two buildings, the Victorian Turla Park House built in 1865 and the modern gallery building which houses four floors of exhibitions. The museum buildings are set in 30 acres of spectacular gardens and woodland. Our new boat gallery will fill this open space on the ground floor. At present it is used to store some of our traditional Irish boats but plans to start works in the room are being progressed. The Irish Folklife Collection contains over 30 traditional Irish boats, the Carrucks, a simple but boat type of wooden frame and waterproof skin that you see upturned in this picture, are particularly well represented in the collection with 15 examples, some of which are now over 100 years old. Over the centuries the physical form of traditional Irish maritime vessels were shaped by local necessity and foreign influences. The waters off Ireland's Atlantic coast were utilised for fishing and to transport people and cargo such as turf and seaweed in a time when coastal areas were not easily accessed by land. Working boats evolved to suit their purpose and in doing so they reflected the story of the lives of the populations they served. The role and importance of the Atlantic Ocean and the lives of those living by its waters were recorded in a strong oral tradition that was later collected in the printed works of Irish language speakers such as Thomas O'Crohan, Peg Sears, Seamus McInimra, and Marital Suluan. The National Museum of Ireland too sought to record this fading way of life, the tangible remnants of the, of the relationship between island and coastal communities and the sea are safeguarded and displayed at the National Museum of Ireland Country Life. It is in our inhabited islands and among those coastal communities today that those remnants still exist as a living way of life, as a living link to our past and is, it is for that reason as curator of our new gallery, I feel it is vitally important that the gallery tells the story of the people of our West Coast, past and present. To achieve this, a number of years ago, I set about visiting people and organisations on our West Coast in order to record their stories and to understand the importance of boats in their lives. My fieldwork was halted by travel restrictions imposed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but since the lifting of those restrictions, I have taken to the road and boat again. What I'd like to do today is introduce you to some of the wonderful people I have met so far and to those met and recorded by my predecessor, the late Dr. Seamus McPhillip. Beginning geographically north in our journey through fieldwork, Seamus McPhillip visited this beautiful area of County Donegal called Bunbeg. It's a small town in an Irish speaking area known as a Gaeltacht. Seamus was an Irish speaker himself and he made some valuable recordings in that language with fishermen and boat builders in County Donegal. Jim Boyd from Bunbeg built a Kirk for the National Museum and in this next interview from 2010, Jim talks to Seamus about his time building Kirks. Uh, I built my first Curra when I was about 17 years of age. And, uh, my father didn't want me to build a curry at all because he, he said it would, I would build something that I would drown myself in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'd have more or less built it and owned to him. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it turned out all right and the curry was, was good enough. So from then on, I've been building curries off and on ever since. And what year was that approximately, Jim? That was back in... Uh, uh, but 55 
Wow. Yeah. And how many would you say you have built approximately since then? Oh, no, it'd be hard to say. I would say. <laughs> I would say a hundred anyway or more. Really? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. so you're doing a couple of years? Yeah, I'd be doing, uh, doing a couple of years. The boat in this wonderful watercolour by Donald McPolin is a Bunbeg Curragh, a type made by Jim Boyd. We are fortunate enough in the National Museum to have one of Jim's Bunbeg Curraghs in our collection. Another well-renowned boat builder from Donegal was Jim McElhenney, pictured here fitting the frame of a Dunfanaghy Curragh that he built from memory and without plans. Where the builders of the boats in our collection have passed on, we make efforts to contact their families who would often have taken part in each skilled build. Sometimes the families make contact with us, which is what happened when a daughter of John McLafferty, seen here with the cap, visited the National Museum of Ireland Country Life to share her memories with us. A boat built by her father was acquired by the museum in 1932. Staying in Donegal, the previous mentioned artist and author, boat historian Donald McPolan on the right, recently donated a series of his boats, boat, boat artwork to the National Museum and he is always on hand to share his expertise. Accessing a network of historians, experts and academics is also an important source of information. Maritime festivals, regattas and conferences often bring those sources together. I was grateful to have been asked to speak at the Maritime Heritage Weekend Festival in Rosses Point, County Sligo, late last year. It was a very useful occasion to network with people from County Sligo where I had many contacts and who were passionate about their maritime history and were proud and willing to share it with me. Some old friends of the museum were present in Ross's Point. The relatives of the famous McCann boat building family of Money Gold, County Sligo, committed themselves to assisting with further information. The museum acquired the contents of the now closed McCann boatyard in 2014. At any event I attend, I always share the details of a blog I write on my research for the boat gallery. The blog can be found on the museum's website, Our Irish Heritage. Attendees are able to share their stories and photos with me through the site and it has reaped huge rewards that will enrich the gallery content. This article shared on the blog by Sligo author and historian Joe McGowan focuses on the large sailboat type known as the Zulu. Where a boat type is too large to be displayed in our new gallery, information contained in the public's engagement with us through my blog Traditional Boats of Ireland's Wild Atlantic Way will represent that boat type on interactives and other platforms. Further south from County Sligo, I had the pleasure of attending a regatta last year in Belderig in County Mayo that had been revived after almost 70 years. There I interviewed Brendan McInnauna. Brendan was born in Belderig in 1936 and was involved in organising the boat races there in the 1950s. He explained to me how important the Curragh was to Belderig. The Curragh uh, uh, fed the people, mm. fed the people mm. in Belderig. Uh, in 1950, there were 50 men fishing in 10 curves out of the year. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it was uh, uh, my own obsession with it is that uh, uh, I realised early on how important economically it was to build Eric. And that was really my fascination, my lifelong fascination mm -hmm. with the colour. Very good. A man with a passion for his home and its people, Brendan wrote the Beldera Curragh and its people, Curragh Dún Cúacán, August and Winchester, in 2010. Not far down the Mayo coast from Belderig is Ireland's largest island, Achill Island. A boat synonymous with the island is the Achill Yall. With the boats no longer working, the annual Achill Yall races, recorded in my next clip, See history come alive as the last surviving yawls get a run on the waters they once regularly mastered.
the Tell us. How many bolts can you see? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, As a result of our engagement with the Ackle community, a gentleman approached the museum and donated the sale of a 100-year-old Ackle yawl. His family is steeped in Ackle's maritime history and he has kindly agreed to be interviewed at his family's home in Ackle, where his grandfather's yawl is tied up. Where communities gather, there is a shared sense of pride in one's place. A day for your neighbourhood to show itself off and to share all that is good about your part of the country with outsiders. Crinu Namod, the gathering of the boats in Mayo, is one of those events where the racing is enriched by friendship and storytelling. Travel south along the Mayo coast and you reach Clare Island at the mouth of Clue Bay. The island is accessible by ferry from the mainland, a journey of approximately 6 kilometres. In 2020, I arranged to travel to Clare Island to meet some of the local fishermen. One, Michael Gallagher, also a builder of Carracks, invited me to his house and spent some time telling me his story. It's a common story from the west of Ireland, emigration and return, decline of one's home and of struggle to encourage the youth to remain. A fellow islander, Eddie O'Malley, told me of how in his youth in the 1960s there would have been seven curricks with two men in each fishing lobsters from Portaculia on Clare Island. There was a good income to be made for those fishermen who were also farmers. South of Clare Island lies the island of Inishturk, where similar stories were common. Like generations of his family before him, Mikey O'Toole often sits in his house in Ballyhear, Inish Turk, and looks down onto Port Dune Harbour and out across the south coast of the island toward Connacht's highest peak, Mwilri, and the Sheafree Hills on the Mayo mainland. It is a magnificent view I was also fortunate to appreciate. I had travelled the hour long ferry ride to Inish Turk to talk with Mikey about local fishing traditions. The surname O'Toole has a long connection to Inish Turk. Working on the First Ordnance Survey of Ireland, John O'Donovan wrote in 1838, This island is said to be in the possession of the O'Tools for an unknown number of centuries. Much of Mikey's life has been shaped by the island. His great-grandfather built the house in which he and his wife Mary Ann raised a family and still live in. Mikey followed in the footsteps of his great-grandfather, grandfather and father who all fished the waters around Inish Turk. Today, Mikey is the last fisherman based at the small harbour. For a heavier load than the Carrick could manage, larger sailboats were used. No other is more associated with County Galway than the Galway Hooker. In this next short clip, Coley Nogo Hernan sails his family's Galway Hooker, the Nora Beg, with her black sails into the Claddagh. <laughs> I can definitely already tell Like your answers will suggest stop texting because you're not really, you're not open, you're not open to that. father, also Colleen, is a master boat builder and expert on the history of Galway boats. His work with the Galway Hooker Sailing Club in restoring and promoting the use of the hookers among a new generation is vital work in preserving these old workhorses. At the Sailing Club's workshop at Galway Docks, hookers are openly restored and members of the public are encouraged to attend and ask questions. Here, the hooker loving is receiving her new planks during restoration work in 2020. Colleen Senior is happy to share the knowledge he has amassed since growing up as a child around boats. Colleen is standing beside a curragh, almond, a wooden curragh, at a talk he gave at the Galway Docklands Festival at the Clada in Galway City. I've been in contact with Colleen and I hope to interview him in the near future. He's a great story and even built his first boat when still a teenager.
Older archival material that documents the lives of our coastal and island communities is being used in our gallery, but it is also being added to. In June 1968, museum curator John O'Sullivan and photographer Brendan Doyle spent eight days on the island of Inishir documenting local man Michael Keneally as he built a 19 and a half feet three-man curragh complete with mast and sail. I visited Mikey's daughter Maura on the island where she still lives and she gave her recollection of the museum's visit and provided great information on her father's and her mother's role in the small curragh building business. Because of my visit to Maura we now know her mother played an important role in dealing with correspondence with clients and the ordering of materials from the mainland. Here, in this photo, a team from RTE who had joined me on Inishir interview Mora for the nationwide programme. In 1968, the museum employees travelled to Inishir on the ferry, the Navena. The Navena serviced the Aran Islands from the Galway mainland from 1958 to the late 1980s. Its import to the islanders was immense. Objects from the Navena are difficult to secure, but I was delighted to meet and interview John Reck, who had worked on the Navena and its predecessor, the Dune Angus. Here, John tells of the difficulties loading animals onto the ferry for fair day. On fair days, then, they would bring the cattle from the beach. Now, they'd, be, they'd have them ready, because they'd have a rope, a belly rope right around them and a hook on top. And they have sometimes a lot of trouble getting the beasts out into the water. But they'll catch them by the head, horns, whatever, and they'll place their their chins or whatever they hate to call them at that time. Uh, at the after end of the curve and they would row out and, and approaching the ship then I would be on duty there ready with the hook to attach it to the belly band of the uh, and the winch of course would be operated by one of the crews and they would winch him up we'd swing him in and he comes straight on to the deck the, the bottom deck that is of course that'll go down further and uh, they'd be all put in there now some of them would be anxious, like as soon as their hose would touch the ground, you know, they'd make a dive and uh, be very agitated, but they'd settle. Only through a network of enthusiasts, and one in particular John Tynan, the secretary of the Cork-based Curragh Rowing Club, Navoga Kirky, I got to visit Matty O'Malley. Matty had been busy in his timber yard in Woodford, County Galway, building a large knobby from the design and measurements of the Santa Maria knobby that was built in 1918 for the Claherty business family of Roundstone, County Galway. The Santa Maria was built by Bartley Claherty on Inishnee, County Galway. While obviously talented in working with wood, Matty sails and has a knowledge of the history of the knobby that he acquired partly while researching the boat on the Isle of Man. The Congested Districts Board encouraged the use of newly built Isle of Man type knobbies among Irish fishermen after its establishment in 1891. The use of the knobbies declined as working boats, like most sail powered craft, and it is rare to find an example in good condition today. That makes the work of Matty O'Malley all the more important. In 2021, John Tynan had invited me to row with a school group he was taking out on Loch Dur, County Clare. The school spent the day rowing beautifully built West Clare Curracks on the lake. Some of those Curracks being used were made by the well-known Clare Currock building brothers, James and Alan Madigan. It took me some time, but I got to meet James Madigan this year in Kilrush Boatyard, where he showed me his current bills, and he talked about his and his own family's history in boat building. 
Well, yeah, my gra yeah, my grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather. He was the last cork. Yeah. He was the last sort of commercial cork we were around here. Is this the Blunny side of the family? The Blunnies, yeah. yeah. Sign of Blunny. He was the last of them. And he, he yeah, just down over there, where the Dolphin Centre is now, that was actually his workshop. Ah. You know, it was, it, um, it was, well, he, he, uh, he built many, lots of corks inside there, so fishing boats. It was the tri three men's and two men's, like, along that style. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, um. And your own father built them then yourself, was it? Oh, I did, no, my father didn't build them. My right. father was big into rowing now. He was, uh, he's actually an All Ireland champion rower. Right. You know, so. Wow. But, um, but no, but my father was, no, was my grandfather's side that was into the cork building. But, uh, yeah, so, like, when I was a young fellow, I, oh, I was about 14, 13, 14, 15, I spent summers with him. James has agreed to build a clear curragh for the museum, using the traditional techniques and skills passed on to him by his grandfather, who worked in his boatyard with no electricity or running water. Community engagement with groups and individuals in County Kerry has been exceptional. Bay Lidges Kerry, the Kerry Folklore Group, donated a series of interviews it had carried out with boat builders from that county. A stunning to scale model of a Kerry fishing smack was also donated to the museum. It was built and rigged by Crohan O'Malley in Kerry in 1933. Smacks were used in South Kerry in the early 20th century. Crohan was a well-known and respected boatman and member of the local Coast Life Saving Service and the Waterville Anglers Association. Good quality built model boats with a known provenance will add to the gallery where full size boats cannot be included. In 2002, the National Museum of Ireland chose to build a Bell Derrick Kirk to be included in its collection. Skilled boat builder Paura Godinin and his team from Mehelmara Community Boatyard in Cork were tasked with the job. I visited Mehelmara in Cork in 2021 and had great conversations about their work with the team there and looked back almost 20 years before to when the Bell Derrick Kirk was built. In this clip, Paura Godinin outlines to Seamus MacPhillip what sources were studied when building the boat for the National Museum. The information we had on the Bell Derrick um, if I can introduce Brendan, it's Bearder, and his father, Anthony Catherine, Jim Shell, on the uh, Archin. Yeah, his father, uh, who was the national school teacher in Belgaway, documented the type of product that was in Belgaway in the drawing, which is in the book there that Brendan has recently published. Um, that was one source of information. The other source I have, which I can show later, I don't have it in slide form, is we did a survey in 94, 95 uh, from about the Hatchet where we travelled all of the coast, documenting the products to, to uh, an extent, photographing them. And uh, we have some photographs here from Bilderwey. And we, we purchased uh, a wreck, really, of a product, which was really, really intact, but it's bits missing from it, uh, from Belgaui, and we took that to Cork. Engaging with organisations is a way to reach those you otherwise cannot reach for various reasons. Some are leisure-based groups. The Irish Islands Marine Resource Organisation organises those involved in the marine sector across the offshore islands of counties Donegal, Mayo, Galway and Cork. The work of IMRO ensures those island communities play a central role in the sustainable management of their marine resources. IMRO also take a very active role in preserving the heritage of communities it represents. The organisation successfully applied to have Markin and Natalu landmarks included in Ireland's National Inventory of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Seafarers on Irish islands use landmarks for orientation and navigation at sea. Traditional seafaring information has been passed on orally and through first-hand experience from generation to generation. The many organisations and clubs I have contacted over the past few years have been extremely helpful. Since opening in 2001, the National Museum of Ireland Country Life has encouraged cooperation with third-level institutions and we continue to strengthen those relationships. 
the Irish Folklife Collection and the various staff who work with the collection provide valuable and relevant information to students who visit us at Turla Park. Over the past number of months, I have met with several student groups that booked behind the scenes tours of our reserve collection. Our reserve collection is that section of the collection that is not on public display and is stored in buildings usually only accessed by museum staff. A visit from MA students from University College Dublin and their lecturer Barbara Neeloyne was recently followed by two visits from University of Galway students and lecturer Connor Newman. Most recently, I gave a tour to fourth year students from the Atlantic Technological University Mayo and their lecturer Neve Hearns. This is the latest draft of how our new gallery will look, the boats at the centre of the display, but it is the stories of the people who built, worked and sailed in them and the families and communities they fed that will be to the fore. Thank you for joining me today. If you would like to contact me, please email me at ncampbell at museum.ie and visit Traditional Boats of Ireland's Wild Atlantic Way on ouririshheritage.org.